is it? Compurgation? Computation? Compute. Oh, here it is. Computer. A person who computes. No, that's not it. A device used for computing, specifically an electronic machine which by means of stored instructions and information performs rapid, often complex calculations or compiles, correlates, and selects data. See also analog computer, digital computer. That doesn't tell me very much. Maybe I should look in the encyclopedia. Danny, are you in here somewhere? I'm in the living room, Dad. Hey, I thought you were going to meet me outside. Oh, I got busy with the dictionary. What were you looking up? Computer. They're going to put a couple in the school next week, and I don't really understand what a computer is. I mean, I sort of know, but not really. I figured I should learn something about them before next week. Well, I know a little about them, but not enough to really give you a good explanation. Did you try the encyclopedia? I was just going to look it up in there. I'll study them with you. Let's see. Uh, volume one, two... Oh, here we go. Okay, computers. Wow, there's an awful lot on the subject. Why don't we start with a little history? Well, there can't be much history. Computers have only been around about 30 years. Not according to this. About 1832, an English inventor and mathematician, Charles Babbage, was commissioned by the British government to figure out a system for calculating the rise and fall of the tides. What's so important about that? England controlled the oceans in those days. And they needed to know the rise and fall of the tides in the bays and estuaries where their ships might be. That's a pretty hard job, Dad. You have to figure out things about the earth and the moon and the sun. Mr. Babbage knew that, and he figured out that the only way to do it was to build something he called an analytical machine. He put a bunch of gears, levers, and counter wheels in a box, about 50,000 of them, and made the first programmable computer, complete with, well, I'll be darned. He used punched cards to put data in his machine. I guess nothing's really new, is it? Well, the punched cards aren't. It says here that punched cards were used to control automatic weaving looms in the early 1700s. How big was his invention? Doesn't say, but it could add, subtract, multiply, and divide, as well as having its own memory. And once they set it to going, it could work on its own. It wasn't run by electricity, was it? No, it was all mechanical. They had a problem with all the gears and levers because the tolerances had to be very close, and the technology at the time wasn't that good. Apparently, Babbage's big computer was never operated successfully, but several smaller versions were built that worked well. Probably his machine took a long time to get the answer anyway. I mean, with the gears and levers, they don't work as fast as electrical parts. The encyclopedia says that lots of people tried to make computers with the same system Babbage did, but they ran into the same problems, you know, making all those finely machined gears plus making them move. Aha! Now we come to the first revolution in making computers, the electric relay switch. Do you know how a relay works, Danny? I think so. It's just a switch that works. I mean, you open and close it by putting a current to it. That's right. But the relay isn't just electrical. It's also mechanical, partly, because they use springs. They eat a lot of power, and if the contacts get dirty or corroded, they're not too reliable. Why did they call it a revolution, then, if the relays weren't that great? Well, it was certainly a big step over using gears and levers. Let me see here. Yes, a relay computer was built in Germany in 1941, the Z3. And they changed what it could do by changing the connections between the relays. You mean they had to unsolder everything to change how it worked? I don't know if the connections were soldered or if they used some sort of quick connection or what, but it must have taken a long time to make a change. I always thought that IBM had a lot to do with computers and that sort of stuff. My teacher said IBM was a kind of pioneer. We're just coming to that. IBM built a computer at Harvard University from 1939 to 1944 called the Mark I Sequence Controlled Calculator. And it was used to perform calculations for the Manhattan Project. You mean that they used the Mark I to help build the first atomic bomb? That's what it says here. And that was a relay computer, too? Yes. Say, wait a minute. All I wanted to know is what is a computer? And we're talking about stuff from a hundred years ago. Well, I think the best way to understand something is to know its history. And besides, you looked up the definition in the dictionary and you say it didn't tell you very much. Well, it didn't say how it worked, just kind of what it did, and in 25 words or less. Computers are a very complicated piece of equipment, so a dictionary isn't going to go into a lot of detail. If you don't want to go on with this, we can uh, always start cleaning up the garage. Uh, 
No, it's interesting. Let's keep reading, Dad. Okay. Hmm. Okay. After the relay switch computers came the ones that used vacuum tubes. You know, like the tubes in that old radio we have. So the vacuum tube was another revolution. Yes, it was. You see, the vacuum tube has no moving parts, and it switches the electrons off and on a lot faster than anything mechanical. It's pretty reliable, and now the scientists could think about doing thousands of computations instead of just hundreds. But that's still pretty slow compared to what computers can do today. I thought you didn't know anything about computers. Well, I watch the news sometimes. Everyone should know about computers these days. They're part of everyday life. Wait a minute. You're skipping some pages. I just want to see what's coming up. Hey, look here. It's a list of electronic computers from 1939 on. Let's see there. Hmm. The first computer using vacuum tubes was the Atanasoft Berry, made at Iowa State University from 1940 to 1942. And look how much the Mark I weighed, five tons. How about the ENIAC computer, 18,000 vacuum tubes? It took up 3,000 cubic feet of space and weighed 90 tons. See what it says here? That a 1980-style personal computer that cost about $500 can do more than the ENIAC could do. Hey, let's talk about what computers can do for a little bit, and maybe how they do it. Hmm. Let me see where it explains something about that. Well, there's another definition of a computer, but it doesn't say anything more than the dictionary. An electronic device that manipulates symbolic information according to a list of precise and limited instructions called a program. What does symbolic information mean? Well, electric switches, and that's what computers are made of, basically have only two positions. They're either on or off. Just like a light switch. Right. The men who developed the computer use what is called a binary system for telling a computer what to do. Bi means two, so there are only two numbers in the system, zero and one. These two numbers are combined in millions of combinations that direct the computer to do what it does, to solve problems or play games or give you information. The numbers are symbols, that is, a certain sequence of numbers will represent the letter A, for instance and the computers translate the symbols into whatever it is you want to appear on the screen, including colors and movement, like video games. That sounds too simple, Dad. The basic process and idea are simple, but when you get into the very complicated problems computers can solve, and the computer graphics, I suppose the process becomes very complicated. What you said makes sense, but I still don't quite understand what a computer is. How about if we talk about a computer like a tool? Like tools in the garage? Sure. A computer is a very complicated tool, nothing more. I thought tools just fix things. That's what computers do, in a matter of speaking. If you have a computer that's got a mathematics program in it and you have a problem, the computer fixes the problem for you. It solves it. Would you consider a typewriter a tool? I don't know. I just call them typewriters. Well, typewriters are tools also. Tools that make the job of writing easier and faster. Now, if you have a computer that's programmed to be a word processor, those are the computers that print out pages? There's a little more to it than that. But you got the idea. Anyway, a word processor is just a fancy name for a typewriter. It does the same jobs as a typewriter, but it's easier to make corrections, it makes as many copies as you want, and lots of other things that make writing easier and faster. I understand, I think. Let's see what the dictionary has to say about tools. Here, definition 2B, the whole machine. Then definition 3. Anything that serves in the manner of a tool, a means. That is, books are a scholar's tools. The important thing here is the word means. A tool is a means or a way of accomplishing something, of doing a job. Well then, can you call an airplane a tool even though it flies? Of course. An airplane is simply a means or way to get people and freight from one place to another. Airplanes are the tools of the pilots, the things they get the work done with. So a computer is a tool that people solve problems with, or write, or play games on. Or balance their checkbook with, or hundreds of other things. A complicated tool. I like that. It doesn't seem as unfriendly as a microprocessor or a computer. A computer is made to work for you, not the other way around. Sure, people misuse computers for all kinds of things, but that's the people's fault, not the computers. They're just machines. They do exactly what they're told. And human beings have to tell them what to do, right? Mm-hmm. I wonder, will computers ever be able to think for themselves? There's a lot of research going on in that sort of thing. 
trying to make computers that can reason on their own, but it's hard to say what will happen. Now that I sort of know how to think about a computer, let's look at some more about the way they are made. Okay. Where are we? Oh, oh yes. Now we come to the next revolution, the transistor. The transistor was developed in the laboratories at Bell Telephone. A transistor is a single block of material called a semiconductor, and it's a lot smaller than tubes, of course. They call this the second generation of computers. The first one was when they used the vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. The transistor allowed the computers to be a great deal smaller and use a lot less electricity. First they used the relay switches, right? Then the vacuum tubes, then transistors. All of those were really just different kinds of switches, only they got smaller. Right. They call the switch a flip-flop, too, because it's either on or off. In 1959, there was another step forward in making computers smaller and more efficient. This was the introduction of the integrated circuit. Let me take a fast look at this. It gets pretty complicated. Hmm. Okay. Before the integrated circuit, they had to put the switches, whether relays or vacuum tubes or transistors, together with other pieces of electronics, like resistors and capacitors and conductors. With the integrated circuits, they could eliminate some of those things and put the whole circuit on a tiny chip, which was one complete switch. You mean they could change one switch just by changing the chips? like the TV repairman did when he fixed the set. It's the same principle. The chips also saved a lot of time because when they made computers the old way, every single piece had to be assembled and tested all the way along. They could make hundreds of integrated circuits in the same time it took to make one circuit the old way. That's why they got cheaper than mass production. The more you make, the less they cost. Sure. You're too young to remember those pocket calculators when they first came out, but they were pretty expensive. Now you can buy a good one for under $10. Boy, I'm getting hungry. Let's go to the kitchen. We can finish this later. I could use a sandwich, but I'll take it with me to read while we eat. Oh, we can do it later. Okay, but the garage really needs cleaning. You read while I make the sandwiches. Okay, just a minute. I lost the page. Here it is. The transistor was used in the second generation of computers, and that lasted about 15 years. The third generation started in the mid-1960s, and there were two types of computers, the mainframe and the mini-computer. The mainframe is very big, and it needs air conditioning to keep it cool, and a lot of people have to take care of it. Remind your mother to get more peanut butter, Danny. Uh-huh. Then there was the mini-computer. They were a lot smaller and less expensive than the mainframe computers. They were also popular because there didn't have to be a lot of people to run them. Pretty soon, there were more mini-computers than mainframe computers. Eat your sandwich, and, and I'll read for a while. Yuck! You eat mustard with your peanut butter? <laughs> Only when I'm reading about computers. Okay, now we come to the fourth generation, the microprocessor. In 1971, the Intel 4004 was produced, and this was the first time the entire central processing unit of the computer was put on one single chip. With the CPU chip, some memory chips, and some other integrated circuits, a fully functional, general-purpose, stored program computer can be built that weighs only a few ounces. I don't understand about the difference between the, uh, central processing unit and memory chips. Why does there have to be two kinds? The CPU is the brains of the computer, but it doesn't store information, so you have to have other chips for that. Here's something interesting. The capabilities of mainframe computers are measured in millions of instructions processed per second. Personal computers operate usually about less than one million instructions per second. But mainframe computers operate at millions of instructions per second. There's a mainframe computer called the Cray, which can process a hundred million instructions a second. That's too many to even think about. I wonder if computers ever get headaches from thinking too much. <laughs> I don't know, but all this is starting to give me one. Okay, Danny, do you think you understand what a computer is now? Generally, I mean. Do you? I'm not the one who's going to use one next week. Yes or no? A computer is a tool. And? It's a tool to help you do almost anything you want. It can solve mathematical problems, play games, type, store information, Balance a checkbook. Or help us get to the moon. Yeah? Sure. The calculations for the space program have to be so fast and accurate that humans couldn't do it. Computers are the answer for space travel. 
And computers are a bunch of switches that go off and on. They use combinations of one and zero to figure out what we want them to do. Not too scientific, but you're on the right track. And computers can't do anything unless human beings tell it what to do. How do humans tell it what to do? They make up programs and run them through the computer. Hey, a few pages back, there's a picture of a microprocessor. Here it is. Why did you want to see it? It shows the main parts of a computer, and I should know what they're called. First, there's the central processing unit. The brains. Then there's the memory storage in the CPU. Okay, here's the keyboard. That's where you talk to the computer. Over here is the video display screen, so you can see what you're writing. What's this over here? Oh, outside memory storage. You store information on tape or... What's this? Floppy disks? I'll look that up. You use outside memory so you can increase the size of the computer's memory, it says here. At the bottom of the page, it explains a floppy disk and a hard disk. A floppy disk is a thin disk of plastic coated with a magnetic material. A hard disk is made of metal coated with magnetic material. Thank you, teacher. What's left? The printer, so you can have permanent copies of whatever you put into the computer if you need them. I think you've got a good start at being acquainted with computers. I've learned a lot too, Danny. Yeah, I won't feel so strange next week. And I've learned a lot more than just about computers. What? That mustard on peanut butter sandwiches is awful. Thank you.